welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimez. And I'm Brian Rollenbacher. And we have another super fun, festive episode for you today. That's right. I added a Christmas tree to my outfit. Oh. Very festive. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to today's show. In Culture Talk, Sandra's going to be interviewing philosopher George Haraxon on social media and the social dilemma. And you know, this is kind of a pretty trying year for a lot of people. So Jeff is going to be talking with Ken Samples in Give and Take about God's mercy in pain. So pretty poignant topic. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. Um, that might be one you want to share with a lot of people too after you watch it. Yeah. First up though is RTB 101. Crystal will be speaking with Dr. John Lennox, asking him the question, how do we share our faith in a hostile world? Let's check it out. Now it's time for RTB 101, where we help to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And I'm joined today by Oxford mathematician, Dr. John Lennox. It's our honor to have you here today, Dr. Lennox. Welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I am so compelled by learning more about your story. Recently, you were involved with the film Against the Tide, and we're going to tell our friends how they can see that film coming to them very soon at the end of this segment. But I want you to share a little bit about your decades of experience in sharing your faith. You've, you've participated in several debates with prominent atheists over the years. I'm wondering what motivated you to do that? Well, I didn't start there. <laughs> I simply believed, even as a boy, that I should share my faith. It was not something I should keep to myself. And I began in simple ways of sharing things one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the most helpful things that I discovered, but not for some time, was the statement made by the Apostle Peter in his first letter, where he says that we are all, all Christians, are to be ready to give an answer to all those who ask us a reason for the hope that is within us. And it dawned on me that this is not talking about preaching. It is actually talking about a response to a question. So it's talking about small groups or one-on-one -on -one conversation. And it puzzled me because how do you get people to ask you? And that developed later on into favoring, and it's the heart of the Oxford teaching system, the Socratic method, that is learning to ask questions. And there was a seminal incident when a younger student at Cambridge, I mentioned this first to him, and I said, you know, I think I'm ready to give answers, but nobody asks me. And he laughed and he said, have you ever thought of asking them? And I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, ask them for the hope that is within them. Well, I said, if they're not believers, they have no hope. He said, try asking them. And that led to a revolution in thinking because what I discovered is the best way to get to know people at a more than superficial level is to keep asking them questions. And I try, though I don't always succeed because I'm Irish, I suppose. I try to, when I meet somebody new, to keep asking them questions until they ask me one. Not theological or philosophical questions, but questions that get to know them. And I discover that people love to be asked questions about themselves. And eventually, unless they're crashing bores, they will ask you a question. And so you seek to develop a friendly relationship rather than being under inner pressure that you've got a Christian message that you've got to give. And that, of course, means that you react badly, you come across badly, and it's the only opportunity you get. So I take from this the sheer importance of making friends with people and gradually as the opportunity arises to share what they believe is important in life so that you have the opportunity of doing the same thing. And one of the most important things in that process is to always give people space, be the first person to back off because no one likes to be intimidated or forced into a corner. 
And it's all those kind of things I, I decided not long ago, somebody was listening to me speak, to put into this little book, Have No Fear. You may not have come across it, but it might be useful. It's the cheapest book you'll ever buy. <laughs> Well, I, I think that that's a really good tip. You gave a lot of really good tips there, actually. But maybe we could talk a little bit about fear because I think that many people might be intimidated to step out in, in, in that risk of how do I overcome my fear? Like I, I see the biblical command to, to have given it a reason for the hope that's in me, but I feel nervous about that. Do you have any thoughts about helping us Take that next step. There are really two kinds of fear that we experience. The, the first is the fear of what people think of me. And we need to get through that. But there's also the sense of responsibility, especially when it comes to public debate and discourse and so on. But getting through the fear barrier, let me concentrate on the, the one thing that people fear the most. And that is that they can't answer a question they get asked and they're stuck and i know people who've been silenced for years christians because they made a mess of it now my advice from my own experience is always prepared be prepared to say you do not know if you do not know never pretend to know you never lose face by saying i don't know but you can capitalize on it and I work with some very intelligent people. <laughs> I often get questions. I have not an, an idea how to answer them. And what I have done in my life is say, look, that's fascinating. I'm not sure that I even understand it completely. And I'd like you to explain it more. But listen, I'd like to think about that. Could we perhaps have a cup of coffee next week? Now, that has two effects. One, it tells people that you don't believe you know everything. And that's very good. Secondly, it tells them that you're actually interested in what they've asked, that you're taking their questions seriously because you're prepared to do a bit of research on it. Now, one of two things can happen. Sometimes they'll say, well, actually, that's not my real difficulty. My real difficulty is whatever. And you make progress. Or they say, you know, I'd like you to do that because it really bothers me. And then they tell you a little bit more. And as a result of that, the friendship deepens. The sad thing is often people, and here's a second little tip that I found useful. They come across folks like me who've been doing this all my life and you and, and others like your folks and reasons to believe, and they're totally overwhelmed. So I say, look, you don't have to read a hundred books on apologetics. What you should do is find out what the key question is that's on the mind of a friend you're talking to, and then do your work on that one question until you find an answer that not only works for you, but for them. And then that'll lead to a second question. And you'll never forget the answers to those questions because they are coming out of live problems. The trouble is, if we read all the books that various intelligent people have written and their answers to questions, we might as well not bother because we don't remember the answers because the questions have never been real for us. Mm -hmm. And it's this business of getting involved in real questions that will take us to thinking, take us to logic, but also take us to scripture. And of course, there's a central theme of my life is that the danger is that as we grow up as Christians, we spend less and less time thinking through scripture and understanding it more and more. Very good. And I want to let everyone know once again, they can go to againstthetide.movie. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Lennox. My pleasure. Welcome to Culture Talk. This is the segment where we talk about culturally relevant topics that you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with George Haraxon. He's a professor of philosophy and ethics, and he's also an RTB staff member. Thank you for joining us, George. I am excited to be here, Sandra. Yeah, you know, we're going to be talking about a Netflix documentary called The Social 
Dilemma. And I just recently watched it. I know it's been kind of blowing up all over, of course, course media um, but it starts off with a really powerful quote it says nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse um, so there's no doubt that social media is certainly vast um, and it's very powerful but how do or what do we know about its potential curse well I was just glad they started with a, a Greek tragedy author you know, quote so that warmed my heart right off the bat being a a philosopher and knowing that time about the time of Socrates there. Um, but yeah, that's a great quote. And what are the, what's the potential curse? I, you know, if we could think of this, let me give you a model to think about this issue. Um, when sometimes people think of virtues, they think of a vice. Well, here's the virtue. Here's the vice, but Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, many Christian ethicists and others, uh, talked about how, especially Aristotle said, the golden mean. For every virtue, there are two vices. And so I can have courage, but courage has two vices. I could be foolhardy or I could be a coward. So there's a deficiency and an excess vice. And I think when it comes to something like this, though we can't, we're not saying social media is a virtue per se, but if you think of it that way, kind of, you have to like be on a balance beam, but you can fall off on both, both sides. And I think social media can have a deficiency, but it also can have a, an excess. That's a really good point. I like how you paint it as kind of a virtue and a vice because we can kind of see that play out when we engage in social media. We can see those who use it as a vice and are just constantly posting. Um, and, you know, maybe those who are, um, less engaged and um, for better or for worse. One of the things that they brought up in this documentary is how social media affects mental health um, and it's training the mind to come back to it. So it's set up to really um, encourage us to go back, to ping us, to give us notifications, um, to keep refreshing that feed and getting more um, and really just kind of committing our life to social media. Um, what would you say um, would be a helpful tip to help us be responsible in their interactions with social media? Yeah, I, th I think if you use that model that I was just saying, social media can become a deficiency in that the social part can turn into, it can become solitary media instead of social media, right? You're either distanced from it, alienated from it, or it silos you into coming back to it and then you're, you're ignoring the other parts of your life around you. So that's the deficiency part. Uh, social media can become an access to what you just mentioned in that uh, it can be, social media can be, become strung out media where you get strung out and people report being depressed, having anxiety. And I, it was about a year ago, University of Georgia professor Cass Mood, uh, he took to Twitter and he said, how do you manage to stay informed about political news and stay mentally balanced. And then in his next tweet, he confessed that too much time on social media was contributing to his anxiety and depression. So you get caught in a loop there almost. Um, but the documentary itself goes through a couple of, I think, which are, were some pretty good applications. Um, so how do we model and what do we, what do we speak to our children as they're engaging in social media? and it's affecting their mental health and um, just their awareness of um, their value? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I won't throw you under the bus, I'll throw myself under the bus here. Uh, I know a time when, uh, you know, I didn't have access to any of this, you know, and uh, I remember when my wife was first pregnant, I, I wore a pager to be alerted that she was ready to go to the hospital. So the connection was very, very different <laughs> at that time. But my kids, as you said, have grown up. They, they swim in these waters and to them, they're just a fish swimming in the water, but they, they have become savvy in this. But we tried as parents to um, place some boundaries, uh, kind of like a funnel. We started kind of more strict and then we, we opened it up as we learned responsibility and things like that. So one application, and this may be hard for some, some of my friends thought we were too strict, some thought we were too loose. So 
you know, you can't, can't win. Um, but for instance, we had all of our media, TV, computers, all in one public space, one public room. And even to this day, now that they moved into adulthood, we still actually have all of our computers in, this, in the same working space. And that presents challenges, but it also um, protects you from certain risks. So George, can you give us some practical tips then as we're engaging in social media and how we can kind of better, like be responsible with social media? Yeah, these aren't so much from me directly. Uh, the, the, the documentary talks about them. Um, my son who works at JPL in cybersecurity, uh, he even talked to me about some of these and what uh, he's trying to do. Um, and he's totally involved with uh, technology as far as this is concerned. So um, they talk about, you know, turning off notifications as much as you can, because you talked about that being, it keeps trying to capture your attention, capture your intention. Um, installing extensions that remove further recommendations. Uh, it can start, because you can talk or you might search on some, something you want to buy and all of a sudden you're getting all these notifications on what you want to bu what you sh should buy um, you know installing ad blockers are there's plenty of good ones out there today um, also using applications that don't collect your your data is important I teach a class on data analytics and ethics and people are becoming more savvy on to how uh, in the industry corporations marketing is using this information. And that's a whole nother conversation. Um, you know, uh, psychologists talk a lot about turning off devices a half an hour or longer before bedtime, having hum other kinds of human interaction before, uh, before you go to bed instead of being online. Or um, also you can limit some of your time on it by using timers. We did with our kids, I do with myself, I set timers to help me kind of pop out of it, to wake up, uh, to come out of the cave, if you will, uh, in order just to uh, pull myself out of the hyper-focus that I'm in. Well, thank you so much for that, George. If you want to hear more from George, go to reasons.org and search for George Haraxon. And if you want to check out the documentary, go to Netflix and look for The Social Dilemma. Hello, Jeff Zwerink here and welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help you be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today I'm joined again by my friend and colleague Ken Samples, and we're going to be talking about pain and, and why God uses pain. Ken, it's good to have you here today. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be with you. So I know you've written a blog recently uh, titled God, he shouted in my pain, yeah. uh, where you're describing kind of a painful experience and how you see God using that. Uh, kind of tell us, why did you write that blog and what, what were you hoping to communicate in that, in that discussion? Yeah, Jeff, I think that uh, the problem of pain, suffering, and evil is kind of the, it's the ultimate objection to Christianity. And while I don't think any article or any book, you know, I don't think I'm not sure we'll ever answer that challenge to the uh, satisfaction of, you know, non-Christians. But I know that in my own life, uh, God worked in a very painful circumstance of my life. And what I try to do is I, I try to say that uh, God used pain as a severe mercy, severe because it hurt. It was the death of my brother. But it was a merciful thing because I think it, that it drew me to God. And therefore, um, you know, I, I think Christians have good answers. But I, what I was getting at is I think sometimes God can use our pain to draw us closer to him. Well, can, can help us kind of unpack that a little bit, because uh, can you kind of describe the experience a little bit or what? I mean, I know, I, obviously, the suicide of your brother is a big deal, but I know there was more going on at the time as well. Yeah, I was uh, only 19 at the time. I'd never had anybody close to me die. I mean, I'd been to a funeral here or there, but kind of distant relatives. But uh, I was going through kind of a, you know, a searching period. I, I wasn't sure... I just graduated from high school. I was off to college. 
I wasn't sure the direction of my path was going to take. And, you know, this uh, kind of a catastrophe hit our family with my brother's death. And, you know, it, it really, uh, it kind of shook me up because, you know, I was flirting a little bit with kind of religious mysticism and I was studying philosophy and I, you know, I wanted more independence from my parents. I wanted to be on my own. And this just hit me like a load of bricks. Um, I felt a certain amount of guilt that I couldn't help my brother. I, I felt like, uh, you know, I saw my parents who were in a great deal of pain. And I thought, you know, later, um, uh, I read a passage from C.S. Lewis from his book, The Problem of Pain, where he says, God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And only upon reflection that I look back on that, do I realize that, that God got my attention. And, uh, you know, maybe the other things, I, yeah, I, I think I probably heard his voice in the pleasures of life. And I, I know I probably heard uh, his displeasure in me violating his commandments. But I'll tell you, Jeff, this was the most painful thing in my life at that time. And it just, it got my full attention. You know, what you're saying there is kind of remarkable. I mean, I, I've known you for uh, coming up on two decades now. And the idea that you are flirting around with kind of Eastern mysticism, that just seems entirely foreign. Uh, th this, it seems like this really did get your attention, if you will, because that is so counter to how I know you these days. Uh, kind of walk through, how did that work, or what, what kind of made the difference, if you will? Well, you know, I was, uh, I, I was listening to uh, the music of the Beatles, and the Beatles kind of flirted with uh, Eastern mysticism. And, and again, I, I was at a point where I was uh, kind of hoping that I might become a professional athlete. I probably never had enough ability to, to make something like that happen, but that was kind of my goal. You know, I thought, hey, you know, I feel kind of, uh, I, I feel restless. I, I feel kind of uh, empty. And I thought, well, maybe meeting the right woman, maybe becoming a rich professional athlete. Uh, I, I couldn't put my finger on what it was, was that was missing, but I knew something was missing. And then when this tragedy struck, it was like, wow, I, 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 I had nowhere else to go. I felt like, uh, I felt like I was cornered. And I really then had to ask myself, you know, what, what is the meaning of life? And uh, do I really believe in God? So again, that kind of severe mercy, I mean, we don't like pain. I don't like pain. I don't like suffering. But sometimes it's necessary because it, it uh, tethers us to God. And I feel like it probably called me away from many of the things that probably could have really messed my life up. And so it's a severe mercy. You know, I appreciate you sharing that, Ken. And I, I am I'm curious, uh, you, know, you know, I hear a lot of professional athletes uh, often it is some sort of tragedy that drives them into the dedication to what it takes to be a professional athlete. And, and th there's, a, there's a, a, a goodness or a dignity or a, a, a passion about that that is good. What, what is it that made you see that that, while might, there's a lot of benefits that come with that, ultimately wasn't going to fill what you were looking for? Yeah, I, you know, I think that a lot of the things that uh, are good in life. They take a lot of hard work. They take a lot of discipline. Um, I've always kind of been that type of person. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't a terribly talented baseball player, but I kind of made myself a good player by, by discipline and dedication. But when it came to, uh, you know, when it came to the death of my brother, and I began to think, Jeff, uh, you know, my brother, because of his, his depression, because of his addictions, he, his hope of life was overwhelmed by despair. And I, I began thinking, wow, do, you know, do I have any more meaning than my brother had? And it, it, made, me, it made me really think, what, what are the really important things in my life? And, uh, and, and thus, I think God got my attention. Um, 
I would have liked it to have been in a less painful way, but it got my full attention. You know, as, as I'm listening to you, uh, a couple of things stand out. One is that, uh, you know, I, I'm with you. I really don't like pain. And I honestly, I find myself as I get older, I avoid pain more and more. But when I look back on a lot of the things that I enjoy in life, they actually came through pain. Uh, you know, I played sports that requires being in the weight room and doing things to make your body just physically hurt. Uh, my marriage, I, I want that to grow strong. And so that requires wrestling through tough times. It seems like pain is just part of the process that God uses to help us grow. Uh, but it also, in your description, something it's kind of like the mom or the parent who uh, kid is wandering around in a dangerous place is yelling, stop, don't do that. It, it's, yeah. it's to get, our get, to get the kid's attention to, to give them something good instead of allowing them a much greater, more serious pain later. And the irony is we think, well, I'm suffering pain. Where's God? When in reality, God's using the pain to draw us to himself. And so it, it's an irony because at first we think, well, there, God, God can't be in this because I'm hurting too much. But it's in the hurting that God begins to tether us and pull us in. And uh, I've seen him do that in so many different ways, and I know that that was a, a powerful thing he did in my life. Well, thanks, Ken. I appreciate your comments. You know, pain is often unpleasant, and, and I don't want to imply that we've solved the problem of pain and suffering. It's a far more complicated and sophisticated subject. But Ken brings a really important point here, that in Christianity, pain is a part of the world we live in, but that pain is not wasted. God is using that pain to accomplish something far greater than we could probably imagine. You know, I would encourage you to go check out Ken's blog, God Shouted in My Pain. It will encourage you, strengthen you, and help you to be able to share the hope that God has in this pain that people around you are already suffering. That does it for us this week on 2019. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that it helped equip you to share your faith with confidence and compassion. And we hope that you'll subscribe to the show. And also you'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show. We'd love to hear from you and hear what you're doing these holidays. And if you like the podcast version of our show, you can get it on most major podcast services. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast. See you next week. Bye.